Well, good afternoon and welcome to this, our ninth episode of COVID Connect. And last week we said we were going to start to shift the focus here because a lot of people are now asking the reopening question. The bed counts are down at the moment. There's still the possibility of a second surge to come. And as we discussed last week, there's a lot of potential for businesses to start needing PPE that maybe hasn't been addressed as a community. And so we want to continue that discussion as well as looking to the future for what does this mean going forward? I just wanna once again, thank the community that convened this series of webinars. You can see many of their logos on the, uh, on the page here, which we will keep displaying because we wanna memorialize how this community here came together to get everyone talking. And that discussion continues today. Just a couple ground rules, the webinar will be available. Use the chat box anytime you want. <clears throat> Make sure that you say all panelists and all participants when you, uh, post to the chat that way everyone will see it um, if you're about to come on live with us make sure you get off of mute and you know keep it brief name company needs efforts ideas but we do want to hear from you and uh, anything you want to say is is welcome be the ideas efforts you're still undertaking or needs that you have we do hear from people from time to time who say i, I need to get equipment and i don't know where to get it feel free to come on and, and tell us that live and give us your contact information so people can make contact with you um, into being, we do medical device development, regulatory compliance and submissions, designed for manufacturing, prototyping. We've been really privileged to help so many people um, as they've been working on the EUA uh, pathway and just educating people on that. Um, and just ask your question. We're happy to answer it, happy to get you unstuck if there's something that we can help with, either with relation to COVID or any other medical device development questions you have. So what we're going to do today, as usual, is read the latest news. And then we've got some special guests who I think you'll be really interested in hearing from as we talk about this whole question of how do we reopen, when do we reopen, under what conditions, how do we put practical, reasonable constraints in place to, to care for people during uh, reopening when it does happen. We'll check in on the FDA's emergency use authorizations. And then as usual, question and answer, community open forum. We wanna hear from you. We want your thoughts, your comments, your questions, and I'll look forward to that discussion. So with that, I want to tell you a little bit of the news that we're seeing. And I want to start with this. You're wondering why I'm putting a restaurant up on the screen. I had a conversation earlier with a, a friend of mine who runs Max Acadian Seafood Shack here in Saline. And I think it was the conversation that I needed to hear and needed to have to start to understand how we move forward as a community and as a country. Wally McNeil runs Max, and he, he and I didn't talk about my talking about him on the show, so I hope he's okay with it. But this is a person whose business obviously has been impacted by this. And at the same time, he shared with me some experiences he's had with people that he knows who have been in really dire situations involving ventilators at high risk cases, people close to him. And I suddenly saw in this man the balance that I think we need as a community to understand the pressures on both sides and to press forward. And the, the peace that he had in that and the, um, just the drive that he had in that was just really what I needed to hear today. And so if any of you are in the Ann Arbor Saline area and you can send any business, uh, they're doing uh, curbside contactless pickup if you are eating out, uh, send some business uh, Wally's way because I think uh, Wally's a great example of somebody who understands both sides of this equation very, very deeply and is pressing forward and, and doing the right thing. So again, that's not, uh, we didn't talk about my saying that, but I, uh, I do hope that if anyone's in the area, you'll, you'll send some business uh, Wally's way there. As usual, the coronavirus statewide available bed and PPE tracking, uh, nothing much has changed here. The numbers are still down. If you are providing PPE, You'll always find this table very interesting on the page, which lets you see where uh, certain health systems are getting low on PPE. And there still are a few. We see that Beaumont on surgical masks. We see Hurley Medical Center with some needs. We see MidMichigan Health with some needs. So please take a look at that if you are a PPE provider. But of course, I think a lot of the discussion there is now going towards businesses. Businesses are thinking about reopening 
and making plans for that. And um, we're very interested in this whole question of what's going to happen with PPE for that because we understand uh, some of the restrictions that are being reasonably placed there. And uh, that's going to be a very interesting part of the discussion. I wanted to also share this website, uh, covidactnow.org, which uh, Steve on our team pointed out uh, to me uh, this week. This is a really nice one. I'm showing the Michigan page right here. And this shows you things like that R rate that we've heard about many times uh, for the state, positive test rates, ICU headroom used. This is just, I'm not trying to make any points with this at all, but just rather it's a great resource if you're trying to dig into the data yourself and take a look at what's, uh, what's going on. So nice resource there. Wanted to let you all know also about the FDA's virtual town hall. Now did, this did just happen on May. I'm sorry. Uh, I think we've, uh, I think I've got a, an error there. This just happened about an hour ago. Um, I thought it was this last Wednesday, but it's just about an hour ago. Uh, we don't have the data, but they usually record these. So if you are invested in 3D printed swabs or interested in that, really encourage you to come back to fda.gov and get to the webinar once the recording is um, available because they are now going on record and talking about what they're looking for with respect to 3D printed swabs. And as we talked about last week when Brandon McNaughton was on, testing, testing, testing. This is the only thing that's going to give us clarity as to what, what's actually happening. And so the swabs are a part of that. And we're glad FDA is providing some guidance with respect to that. So that's the news for today. Not a lot of breaking news, uh, but we'll keep bringing it to you as, uh, as time permits and as it comes up. What I want to do next is uh, welcome uh, Dr. Dr. Ben Basson and Professor Sridhar Koda from University of Michigan's uh, MSERC program uh, to come with me live. You can unmute your mics and un unmute your video, guys. There's Dr. Yeah. Basson. I think I see uh, Professor Coda on. Are you able to unmute also? Uh, yes, I did. Hi, Jim. Thank you. Hi. How's it going? Do you have video or just audio? Uh, Ben's going to be talking and presenting, so I do have video. Okay, very good. Well, it's good to have you both. I was talking with Dr. Basson just a, a minute earlier, and I think he, you said you got about an hour of sleep because you were in the clinic uh, last night, so we really appreciate your taking the time and coming on with that, uh, with that as, a, as a background to it. Um, but really interesting because you guys have been working on various types of negative pressure systems, as I understand, and, and one of those is getting a lot of traction. And, um, and what, we'd like to hear more about this tent that you guys are working on and what you've been doing with it in the clinic. Yeah, I think we're happy to share. Um, so uh, just as a matter of background, so I work at University of Michigan and I'm an emergency physician, but I work in um, uh, what is really the first and the largest ED-based intensive care unit in the United States. And so we are really at this interface of emergency medicine and critical care. And as such, we certainly have seen um, a number of probably some of the sickest COVID patients in the state mm. um, and see them escalate quite quickly and certainly the need for um, what we call clinical distancing, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, is key. Clinical distancing, not social distancing, but clinical distancing. Yeah, so clinical distancing is kind of the medical equivalent that we kind of think of, which is essentially saying, which I'll get into in a minute, but because COVID is so highly aerosolized and uh, highly transmissible, and obviously it can affect healthcare workers uh, quite extensively, there's some you know anxiety and fear around that as well. And clearly lots of healthcare workers across the world have been infected while treating patients. And so clinical distancing is really creating the maximum number of barriers between us and the patient while still providing the care they need, but not also doing unnecessary things and really limiting our exposure while still delivering care. And so PPE, negative pressure, and you know, there's other strategies to help mitigate that. But uh, so some of these devices help with this clinical distancing concept. Uh, so if you want, I can just uh, share my screen here and uh, just yeah, show you a couple do. slides. And um, let's see if it work here. We tried it before, I think it should work. We can all see that. Can you see slides there, Gene? Yes, you're fine. You okay. can hit uh, you can hit present, but you're you're just fine. Great. Okay. So MSERC is uh, which some of you may have heard of. It's the Michigan Center for Integrative Research and Critical Care, and essentially what it is, it's a very unique uh, center at the University of Michigan, which allows us to kind of cross pollinate across disciplines to really innovate uh, and get out of our silos uh, from disciplines and really think uh, very futuristic and and with a lot of forethought, hopefully, 
And so us out of the clinical realm, uh, who also do some innovation work uh, in the hospital, as well as Dr. Koda, who's a professor of mechanical engineering, uh, and really allows us to again, kind of think as a group uh, without the boundaries or our normal silos of disciplines to really innovate. And so MSERC is really the joining force between a lot of these projects uh, and a lot of these innovations as we go forward. And so we've dubbed this kind of product line, and I think, Gene, you said the tent, and there's actually a tent plus the helmet. Uh, there, we've dubbed them the aerosol uh, kind of line, and they really are uh, extension of the same uh, concept. And so really for us, again, the challenge is with COVID, is it's uh, spread by respiratory droplets and aerosol spread. And so there's a high infectious rate between people, patients, and healthcare workers. Lots of people present with you know, fever, cough, and dyspnea or shortness of breath. And they really rapidly evolve to things we've really never seen before, even really in young patients, uh, to looking really well and then not looking well at all within sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, uh, and kind of go downhill very quickly. And so with this, we need to use a lot of aggressive therapies, but many of those therapies that we conventionally use are aerosol generating. Um, and so we've taken a lot of those things off the table, despite being tools in our toolbox to help patients. We've kind of limited our use of them or taken them off the table, even though we know they can help um, because of the risk of uh, aerosol generation and uh, transmitting the virus. So again, I just spoke briefly about this clinical distancing concept. Is a, we need to isolate patients yet to still take care of them and still protect ourselves to keep the workforce healthy uh, and able to care for you know, additional patients and, and uh, keep the hospital and health systems functioning. And so um, there's lots of use case scenarios for where you need uh, a negative pressure kind of PPE combination. And so for us, the challenges to do that, obviously, as you all know, I think probably better than anybody is there are challenges with PPE acquisition and availability. Uh, there have been, um, you know, certainly in the state, in the country and worldwide for sure, uh, challenges with enough ICU beds, uh, challenges with enough mechanical ventilators, and then negative pressure rooms are really a, a luxury we have in the United States and doesn't, don't exist a lot of other places in the world. Uh, to really help with this clinical distancing concept. So for our solution, so I guess the video played by itself, it's uh, <clears throat> fog testing of the negative pressure in the helmet. But so the first solution we came up with was the aerosol helmet, which is essentially an industrial respirator, uh, which usually would provide positive pressure uh, to the user to filter uh, contaminated air and clean it as you're breathing it. And we essentially reverse the motor to go in the negative pressure or the negative flow direction. So now we're taking uh, whatever is coming out of the patient's mouth or nose, anything they're exhaling, contaminated or not, is basically getting pulled out of the helmet through a HEPA filter and then uh, recirculated back into the air, but after having been cleaned. Uh, and so it allows two things. One is it, l it lets us use some of our aerosol generating therapy, like high flow oxygen, nebulizer therapies and other things, uh, while contained, the, everything the patient's getting and exhaling is contained uh, in their own little portable negative pressure environment right around them and alleviates the need in some cases for negative pressure rooms, which are a luxury, very expensive to build, uh, take up a lot of space and aren't very practical in things like we were standing up like field hospitals, tent deployments, uh, certainly in uh, military deployments like aircraft carriers, you've probably seen the story of the Theodore Roosevelt uh, and other things. And so there's just not availability of those. And so this allows us a very portable, compact, low cost solution for negative pressure. Of course, you're probably providing like oxygen to the, to the patient while they're having the, the, the residuals removed, is that fair? Correct, yeah, so it's allowing us to use these high flow oxygen therapies as well as nebulizer treatments underneath the helmet. Uh, but even if you weren't, it again allows, uh, you know, in theory, as we talk about returning to commercial flight and other things, you could wear these on airplanes, uh, you know, in uh, going shopping. There's lots of other kind of less uh, medical applications of it that could keep people uh, safe in other, in other environments as well. And so I think the extension of that then is the tent, which you mentioned earlier, Gene, which is really a larger form of the same concept. Uh, this is really a portable uh, procedure isolation tent. Uh, again, same kind of concept. It allows uh, high volume, but uh, low speed airflows uh, through the tent. So essentially it's uh, a covering over the patient. It's a connected to that red box there is a, a HEPA filter connected to a vacuum motor or a source. Uh, we can cut holes in the canopy or the plastic underneath and allow our arms to go in to do procedures. Uh, which are highly aerosol generating and highly contaminating otherwise. Uh, and the bottom is kind of free and can be left open and can be draped over the patient's uh, lower torso. And it pulls just a ton of airflow and allows 50 air exchanges uh, per hour, which I'm sorry, 50 times the air exchanges per hour of what a negative pressure room would allow. Um, so about 600 per hour, a negative pressure room is on the order of 12 an hour, air cycles an hour. Uh, and so it creates just a massive amount of flow for 10, uh, allows clinical distancing while allowing us to provide a lot of aggressive care to patients. 
Uh, we've done a lot of fog and aerosol testing and nothing really escapes from the tent at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Even with really high flow therapies on within the tent, nothing uh, comes outside of it. Even with those open uh, arm openings or slits uh, open and being actively used in the tent, nothing really gets out at all. This is just, well. <laughs> I didn't actually know the video was going to play, but that's one of my colleagues, one of my physician partners uh, wearing the helmet, wearing heated high flow, which again is kind of an oxygen source, shoving 60 liters a minute into his nose, trying to aerate his lungs. Uh, but really he, anything he exhales while he's talking or any of that uh, aerosolization coming out of his mouth is not escaping the tent at all. Getting uh, well, he doesn't look too unhappy. No, he's, and actually, so when you wear heated high flow, it's very warm. It's humidified heated high flow. And so it's a really high rate of flow plus it's humidified. And so it's hot uh, and can be uncomfortable at times. And the helmet actually provides this kind of cool fan uh, flow through it. And so it's actually much more comfortable to wear it with it on than with it off. Um, and so uh, that's the helmet and then in the tent, lots of different use case examples. We've uh, used it in the health system uh, under an innovative care protocol and already used it for uh, endoscopy. So doing GI procedures. Uh, while limiting aerosolization. We've done it for tracheostomies or converting patients off the ventilator. Uh, so now having a cut in their neck and the ventilator going that way so they can now eat and drink and, and talk. Uh, and that's a highly aerosol generating procedure. So we use the tent to do that surgical procedure uh, using positive airway pressure, CPAP or non-invasive ventilation, uh, using nebulizer therapies. Uh, we've done intubations and extubations, putting people on and off the ventilators with it. And again, uh, it really allows us to um, do what we need to do and reducing that fear of aerosolization and allow that clinical distancing concept. And again, it allows about 50 times the air exchange that a normal negative pressure would, room would in a very portable, uh, smaller and low cost environment. So we've had just yesterday, we had a large international press conference. So it's starting to gain a lot of traction. Uh, the union, which is one of the oldest kind of medical society dedicated to lung disease and tuberculosis uh, has published two papers, one in the tent and one in the helmet. Uh, they have, uh, it's been uh, released within the Michigan Medicine Health System and to local news outlets as well. It was, uh, and both devices have in separate stories. Uh, it was picked up by the news in Ghana. Uh, it's been uh, picked up by the UK Telegraph. There's an article being published uh, or done in Science, which is kind of the highest profile uh, journal uh, that we're, that we kind of contribute to at times. Uh, and again, just other news outlets, and this has all happened, uh, some of this in the last 24 hours. So it's really started to take hold, and we think it's a, uh, you know, a, it solves a lot of challenges and is a low cost, but very reasonable mitigation strategy, both the helmet and the tent. And so I think I'll stop there. And then, uh, Sridhar, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add, or Gene, if you want to take it from there. Yeah, like I said, one question I had is, so have you guys, I think I, I, think I heard maybe from Megan that um, you guys have had a, a pathway to work with patients on this, some sort of internal, I don't know if it's an IR, IRB or, or uh, IDE or, or, or exactly what, but uh, it, have you gotten to use it uh, with patients in a, in a research context? Yeah, so it's actually under what we call an innovative care protocol, meaning it doesn't need an IRB, but because the, um, it's an innovation in kind of a very short turnaround time that we think provides significant benefit. And there's very little risk to patients. It's really just an extension of PPE. It essentially protects us, but doesn't provide any risk or harm to the patient. Um, it's under, used underneath an innovative care protocol at the university, and we've tested it um, or trialed it with uh, several patients, both the helmet and the tent. And it's really more a feasibility of, you know, can we deliver the care we need, getting feedback from nurses, from respiratory therapists, from other physicians, from the patients themselves. Is it comfortable? Can you talk? Uh, can you communicate? Um, you know, is it lightweight, kind of those kind of feasibility testing. And so we've done uh, quite a bit of that in the last few weeks. That's great. Um, yeah, your other colleagues here, uh, I think I see Dr. Uh, Dr. Haas and uh, Dr. Koda on the, um, on the call. So if, uh, do either of you have anything to, uh, to add? No, I think Ben, ben covered everything really well. I <laughs> That's great. Let's see if our, let's see if our audience has any, uh, any questions for the doctors here um, about these, these novel ideas. I think it's neat because like you said, a, a negative pressure room is such a, um, a luxury um, that we sometimes have here, but you get to these field hospitals and things like that or boats, well, you don't get, you don't get to do that. And so it's a really neat, uh, it's a really neat idea. I'm glad you're able to, to push that forward. We did see, I think, uh, I think Dr. Haas actually answered uh, this in the chat, but maybe we, can, maybe we can do it live here as well. Um, the question was uh, from George, how are you dealing with FDA approval? 
And then another question of, have you looked at glove bags for pre-made tents? Um, I don't know if one of you wants to address that uh, live with the audience here. So let me, I'm talking about, on the FDA approval, some of you may know, uh, Dean Kamen, um, famous American inventor, we're pleased to, you know, share with you that uh, we partnered with him. He's very interested in these devices and his company, DECA, is pursuing the design and commercialization uh, aspects, including the FDA uh, process. Um, certainly, we, are, we, are in the, we need additional manufacturing capacity given the demand for both these devices. So that's where we are at right now. I just want to add one more thing. The negative pressure room, um, I'm not a medical guy, I don't know much about it, but nonetheless, the fact that you're, you're spreading the virus from, from a point source throughout the room and then vacuuming instead, with these devices, you're actually containing the vacuum, containing the virus, and they're, they're you know, the helmet actually provides 22 times more uh, air exchanges than, than um, a negative pressure room. So it's more effective that way. And mm. as, as uh, Dr. Basson pointed out, the tent does like 50, 50 times more air exchanges. Very, that's, yeah. So it's actually more efficient than the, than the room. Um, another question here, if the healthcare workers wear the PPE, is that also covered by the innovative care exemption? Although I guess the, the question here is really, you're focused on the patients. You're focused on isolating the healthcare workers from the patients, right? There wouldn't necessarily be a purpose in this case for the healthcare workers to wear it. Is that a correct understanding? Yeah, it's a, it's a reversal of the technology. Normally you're at a PAP or a positive air uh, purifying respirator uh, is worn by the healthcare workers to isolate them from the patients. This is basically reversing it because it's negative pressure. It's for the patients to wear to isolate them from us. And so there's not an indication in this case for us to wear the PPE. It's for the, the patient too, because the flow has been reversed. Great, yeah. And, uh, Gene, my, name is, my name is Nate. I was hoping just to chime in one more thought. Yeah, Nate, um, absolutely, Dr. Haas. Um, Sorry for not sharing video. I'm wrangling a toddler right now, but we, uh, I thought a, a parallel you brought up earlier, the society and business is reopening. And I think mm -hmm. we're really facing the similar concept in our hospital. And so I've heard, this is kind of rumor mill, but I've heard that all of the elective, uh, cases and surgeries that have been canceled for the last, you know, couple months, if we shut everything else down and did all of those cases 24 seven and take us like four months to dig out of, it sounds like. And so um, there's a, a huge need to find safe ways to do all the backlog of cases, procedures, minor surgeries, knee scopes, things like that. And so um, we see a big use for the tent to helping to dig out of these holes that we're in. Interesting. Uh, makes sense. We had a question from Karen Studer-Abler. She said, how do you clean the device to use with multiple patients? Is this reusable? Is this single use? How are you guys viewing that? So, the, uh, so this, again, two devices. So the helmet itself is disposable. Um, so the helmet and the air hose connected to it are lightweight plastic with kind of a, a Tyvek shroud and they're completely disposable. We do keep the motor and the HEPA, uh, the HEPA filter obviously gets thrown out as well, uh, but the vacuum motor that is portable attached uh, just gets wiped down with uh, Oxivir or you know, antiviral agent and then can be reused. And that's really the most expensive piece of it. The other disposable pieces are just thrown out uh, and then we use new helmets for each patient. The tent is... Um, also uh, reusable, the bases, the base uh, that holds the, the support hoops, the support hoops, as well as the manifold that holds the HEPA filter are all reusable. The canopy, the plastic canopy itself gets thrown out. Uh, the ductwork gets thrown out and the fan is reused so, and just wiped down. So uh, the disposal pieces are quite inexpensive. The reusable pieces is, um, again, we can wipe down and reuse between patients. That's great. That's wonderful. Let's see, any other questions from our audience? Feel free to raise your hand uh, on the attendee list. Um, oh, our good friend, and you know this guy well, Ken Spencer. Hey, hey, Ben, how are you doing? Good, Ken, how are you? Good. I hope you got some sleep from last night. Yeah, I'm good, I got an hour. So one of the other things too, uh, maybe you could talk about the other potential applications here in terms of the military use, you know, in particular, you know, Theodore Roosevelt and, and things out there, right? Could, could have certainly used, you know, this device uh, going forward. Yeah, so uh, I think most people are familiar with the spread of uh, among service men and women on the Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier. Those are, it turns out those are not, one, it's not easy to isolate people in very dense environments like that. And two, those are really expensive, logistically challenging things to take offline, like an aircraft carrier. Um, and so the helmet, especially, uh, again, can be used in these very non-traditional environments. Uh, the military aircraft 
carriers, planes, cruise ships, uh, you know, field hospitals, tent deployments, refugee camps. Again, it's lightweight, it's portable, uh, and it really allows isolation where otherwise you couldn't have it. And interestingly enough, there's a story that came out this morning that the, a lot of the sailors who returned to the uh, Theodore Roosevelt are now have a, are positive again, despite having been negative, are now positive again. And probably again, that is from the dense population in a place where they really can't separate or isolate. And so because this is fairly low cost, very portable, lightweight, uh, and can be you know essentially disposable and then reuse the motor on other patients, this is probably what we think is a solution that is certainly applicable to the military. And um, there is interest uh, potentially from the DOD. That's great. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you guys coming on today. And as we look to the future and how processes change and procedures change and the need for for equipment in the future, this is uh, this is really cool. Seeing the discussion there in the live chat, Dr. Haas, about uh, transport and the uh, masks being used for transport. But we really appreciate you coming on today to share with us. And as this moves forward and and we get into the future, I'm sure it'd be really fun to hear back from you guys about how this uh, how this progresses. Yeah, thank Dr. you, for Bassin, us. Thank yeah, you. Professor Coda and uh, Dr. Haas. Thank you for for being here with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Gene. Next up, I want to welcome our friend Phil Santer, who's the uh, Vice President, Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff for Ann Arbor Spark, who you, if you are in the startup community, in, uh, in the business community in the area, you know uh, all the amazing things that Ann Arbor Spark does to connect people and funding mechanisms and everything else. Uh, let's see, are you there, Phil? I'm here. Feel free to start your video there as well. Sounds great. Hey, how's it going? Hey. How's it going, Gene? I always, I always love being invited into people's homes. You know, it's just like all uh, suddenly. No, no one ever like, invited me over, and now I get to go to everybody's house. Now you're everywhere. Yeah, you can go <laughs> I get to, to everybody's house. house. It's good. great. Oh, man. So how are you doing? Things are, things are going well? Yeah, things, are, uh, things are, are, are as well as they can be, right? It's just um, it's been a lot for everyone to kind of deal with, uh, economic development organizations, companies, uh, people, the whole, the whole gamut. So um, we're holding in there. If I had to guess, I would say you're probably one of those people who, if you thought you were going to get a break over the last two months, got anything but a break over the last two months. Yeah, no, there, there were all these articles on, uh, on about, oh, now everyone's at home. Um, you know, here's what to do with all this extra time on your hands. And uh, I, I, it was the opposite for us, right? We started standing up a couple of different things that we had to go through in terms of some different grant programs. I have two uh, little ones here at home as well. So um, it's not, it's probably been some of the busiest times uh, that I've had over the past few years. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Well, I wanted to ask you, I um, want to, to hear in a minute about like what Spark has been up to and some of the things you've done in response to all this. But I guess as a starting point, you know, we're all in this community together. Where we're seeing businesses. You, you see everything from small established businesses on one side to startups on the other side. And what what are the biggest things that they're facing now as you as you see them and as you meet them? What what's what is what are the big buzzes that you guys are hearing? I, yeah, I think uh, I mean I think the broad and probably the easy answer on that from just kind of looking at it across the board has just been uncertainty, right? And that's uncertainty from uh, any various number of things. I mean, you've already talked about sort of the the refocus on the reopen. Uh, obviously, companies are extremely anxious for that reopen, and you've seen. Um, some that are taking steps in terms of like, how do you do that even ahead or, of, or outside of sort of the standard order of what you would expect and what the, perhaps the government's suggesting because they're that anxious to try and get going. Um, but how to do this most effectively in terms of the reopen, what's the sort of PPE standards that you'll need that you're going to be required to have that are going to make your customers comfortable. Uh, so probably broad level anxiety about those kind of components all the way down to very specific and tactical things. Like I, I haven't heard back on my idle loan that I applied for through the SBA. Uh, I had some certainty over my PPP because I have that connection directly with my bank. Uh, but this other category piece, I'm not getting much confirmation back from, uh, you know, what should I know about that? Um, questions on, uh, on what it will look like from a workforce perspective after they come back uh, and what it's gonna take in order to, to deal with sort of a talent component. Uh, obviously, there's a huge number of people that are in the marketplace right now. I mean, we're seeing unemployment levels that we haven't seen since uh, depression. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, are you going to be able to access the right types of folks and have the right types of skill sets that people are going to need to come back? Um, and then uh, we're also dealing with some companies that uh, it's been interesting. There's especially in the startup community, uh, there's actually a survey that came out from Midwest startups where over half of them either had seen some uh, benefit coming out of this or they were sort of at, at no harm. 
Um, and so they're coming out of this and saying, well, there's actually a chance where we're seeing their highest, depending on what sector there might be in, uh, their, their biggest quarter ever, for example, um, because they're in sort of the right market at the right time. Uh, and then we're dealing with companies where their sales cycles are such that um, things are okay right now for this quarter for Q2, um, but then as they look ahead and what they had expected for, uh, for the rest of 2020 is completely up in the air. And these are companies that often have not had to deal with uncertainty in their financial forecast and the way that they're having to deal with now. So I, I, obviously there's the medical component of all this and then there's the economic component of all this and they're, each of them have their own things to unpack. I'm glad you brought that last point up because I think one of the things that years ago when I started in business surprised me the most is how, you know, you, you, you tend to always hear about the bottom line, but that's not the only line you're tracking. You're tracking all these right. lines and they're all going in different directions and you're trying to figure out how to manage cash flow and contracts and deliverables and all these, all these different things. And right. so when will the crisis hit? When did it hit for one company type or another? Man, that's that's it's totally different and, 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 cer and certain things, especially like, you know, tech is seeing sort of a boom right now in general, right? So if you're related to tech or you're somehow in the, you know, the smart smartphone supply chain somewhere along the lines, you might be having a really good time right now. But uh, as the, as, as BSC sort of changes, as consumers are, are wary later on right now, it might be a completely different point. And the, I think the point that we're hearing is that it's just unclear to anyone to be able to really figure out where that's going to be able to provide. So it, it really goes back to that uncertainty component that I think is keeping a lot of people up at night. Well, and you guys and all your mentors are, are probably fielding a lot of those questions and having to deal with a lot of that uncertainty. And, and, and questions we've never had to deal with before. So yeah, it's been an interesting <laughs> one. Yeah. Wow. Well, so what are you guys up to? What, what kinds of um, large scale responses have you guys been uh, putting forward? Yeah, I think uh, for us, I mean, we're in a position really, I mean, we covered the basics, right, to, to the extent that we could in terms of trying to make sure that we were gathering up the information as much as possible to have things that were related to sort of business recovery, business response. Uh, we put, we launched a couple different sort of business recovery centers that we have available on our website uh, at annarverusa.org. Uh, we've been hosting webinars as, uh, along with what you guys have been doing and uh, have those recorded and that are out there. And then we were asked to try and deploy um, about a million and a half dollars in, in grants and almost micro grants to companies that were a little bit outside of the standard sort of tech mm. startup world. Um, but that went to, uh, to the max of the world, to the, the, the restaurants and to the retailers uh, that were really in some need of assistance. And so we were able to support uh, over 500 companies just in Washtenaw County with, with that effort and really opened up a line of communication with uh, a series of entrepreneurs and business owners that um, likely hadn't experienced something like this before. I mean, when you think about sort of the other economic crises that have happened, um, you know, they weren't used to having to deal with, uh, with sort of government response on that. And so this was kind of a lead into those components. Uh, and now we're really trying to, to shift and, and look up, and again, kind of what you were um, outlining at the beginning of the discussion, um, what should we be looking at in sort of a recovery standpoint? Uh, there are some resources that are available through the Economic Development Administration that we're looking at that we should try and take advantage of, at least for our region and that's throughout the country. Uh, and then we also um, are looking at how do we have, um, think about what are the right supply chain components that we should be thinking about as a community. So as businesses respond, uh, and you know, in any crisis, there's going to be opportunity as well. As businesses begin to respond, how do we make sure that we're leveraging the assets that we have available? You, you just think about the last conversation that you had in terms of the innovation that's going on at U of M, how do you try and leverage that so that we can ensure that we're providing value to the rest of the country, the rest of the world from the Ann Arbor area. Um, so those are just a couple of things that are on our, on our minds at the moment. That's awesome. Now I hope I'm not speaking of turn. I seem to recall that, and, and we didn't talk about this before, so I hope I'm, I'm not misplacing this. I seem to recall that Ann Arbor Spark has like a um, job postings boards and other even basic things like that, that people can get connected to if they're in the, in the space. I mean, it's like, it's like if, if, if you have a business question and you're in the local economy or this is, you should be reaching out and talking to you guys. Yeah, actually it's interesting. The job portal is, uh, continues to be one of our um, probably our most common or most well-used resources that we've had. Uh, and that actually started from another crisis, which is when Pfizer moved out of Ann Arbor years and years ago, uh, we decided that there was a need out there to try and connect the dots in the life science community specifically. I didn't know that's how the job portal. Wow, good. Yeah, that's how it, that's how it started, and um, we get about we still get about forty five percent of our web traffic actually to the the job portal because it's a curated space of uh, of companies that are are hiring in the area. So that's absolutely out there and um, a big part of our work as well. 
That's so cool. I didn't know that tidbit. That's really fun to, that's really fun yeah. to learn. And it continues to serve its purpose today. And obviously a great, uh, a great resource. Um, I don't know if we're going to have any questions here, but I will open up really quick. If you got a question for Phil Santer from, uh, from Ann Arbor spark and uh, otherwise, well, Keith, I'll just add on that. If I can, if I can plug something real quick. Oh yeah, um, please, please. There was a, um, a platform that it was created by actually a startup in, in town called uh, give and take, but it's called give as a as a platform. And it's a place basically to be able to ask for assistance or to be able to provide assistance to people that ask questions. Uh, so we worked with uh, a professor at, uh, at Ross, Michael Gordon to create sort of an Ann Arbor Ipsy focused um, place for small businesses and nonprofits to be able to ask questions. So if uh, I'll add it into the chat here, but if you're available and interested and want to be able to either ask for some support or be able to try and provide it for people for really small companies that are looking for some assistance and it runs the gamut. I mean, you can kind of see what some of the questions are that are out there. We'd love to be able to get people support on that. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's just, it took me initially a few years to understand how the, how the ecosystem works, but the, but the role that you guys at the smart zones play to just be able to, to reach out and, and help and direct and, and give people um, ways to engage if they're, if they're running a business, it's just amazing. So there's the, there's the link there from Phil. Thank so you. All, all panelists and all attendees, you, you got the right, uh, you got the right link there. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming on today. If there's anything you ever want to share with us again, we'd love to love to have you back and I really appreciate you giving us that update. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gene. And thanks for putting these on on a weekly basis. These are great. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate you being there. Thanks again. Wonderful. We appreciate that. So next, I want to welcome on uh, Tim Connor, who is the founder of Alteris Group. Tim, you can uh, unmute your mic and bring your video on. There he is. Hey, here. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for, thanks for waiting here and um, appreciate, your, appreciate your coming on. You and I were talking earlier about um, you guys do educational uh, software yeah. Um, and you guys have been keeping track of what's going on. And I, I think you, you had some interesting observations about an upcoming wave of need that is, is going to be having questions that are starting to get asked. And I uh, thought maybe you could educate us a little bit on this upcoming educational wave that's happening for businesses and then tell us what you're working on. Yeah, so it's a good segue into talking a little bit about just me as an owner and how I felt when the, you know this whole pandemic started to happen and we had to shut down and go into a business continuity mode. Mm. So I've got a little over 100 employees. I've got two locations. I've got a, um, a company in Canada and one here in Southfield. And uh, so you get into that mode of how you keep customers going, how you keep your people working at home and doing all those kinds of things then your mind starts to transition into an owner is how do I keep people safe and how do we reopen the company back mm. some sense of normalcy. And there's a sense of workload that comes on your shoulders when you start to understand all the data that's coming at you from the CDC, HHS, OSHA, different places that are saying we need to do all these things in order to keep our employees safe. And of course the employees are uh, extremely interested in a lot of communication What's the business owner going to do to keep us safe? How are we going to continue to keep our jobs moving forward in this type of environment? And so it get it kind of gets down to some education uh, and processes that can move with the community because everything's in fluctuation. And so that communication process, that training process is pretty fluid. So um, the real spark for what I'm gonna show here in a minute is uh, through the CARES Act, which listed out some training components. They were titled, there's six different training components that you could get grant monies for uh, to train your employees in these categories, like health and safety. So let's just take that one for an example. So they didn't list out details of what the, that content is, but I kind of got our uh, whole training group together to start to build courseware under those categories that we could use with our folks to keep them safe coming back. And then also uh, when you think about coming back into the office, all the traditional kinds of stuff, the PPE kind of stuff that you need, the health screening before you come back into the office and do that daily, how do we put that together? And then of course our own mitigation plan, how do we craft that plan? How do we communicate that out? And so as we thought about that and put it together, we're reskinning a platform and technology that we have in order to accommodate all those things and put that together. And then we decided to start to open that up and talk to some of our customers about this software that we have. And our customers, we're a tier one supplier to the big three. So we've been in discussions with Ford Motor Company and Chrysler about their dealer network, potentially using this to help uh, open their retail stores 
uh, to sell vehicles and stuff. So uh, probably easy for me to just to share out my screen and just go yeah, go ahead slides here. Um, let me go here real quick and just take me a second to get these up. Um, so let me go back one. Hmm. Hey, can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can see you there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's kind of four core features to this, as I mentioned, a health screening. Uh, so employees just ample, just answer uh, three simple questions uh, before they enter into the work site. These are all based on CDC guidelines. And then we have an administrator view that can see, hey, everybody's checked in from a health perspective before they come into the building. Then, as I mentioned, the risk response planning. So local planning for uh, different things that are happening at the high, medium, and low community risk level for COVID transmission. So we want to put that plan together, put it in the tool. We put it together so it's very easy for you to put your own uh, mitigation plans in the tool, sort of a TurboTax version of that, and then uh, publish uh, those plans out to staff. and. Um, Kind of update those so they're you know everything is very time sensitive these days and as i mentioned employee training so this comes out of the cares act this core knowledge that we put together uh, and we put it in a learning management system so the staff can be certified against those courses so that we got uh, that we can see that they're in compliance with those courses and that core knowledge and then there is a reporting um, aspect to the tool where we can see the health status, we can see the training, uh, the training status, and we can also see that they have reviewed our risk plans. So that's essentially what the tool uh, does for us. Um, let's see, go back one. Here is a screen grab of the tool itself. So in the background on the right side, you see there's a portal that is your kind of um, dashboard of everything that's going on. And then you can see the app version. Uh, there to the far right, which is the dashboard that the end user sees. And the end user is taking the courses on their phone, so it's mobile learning, responsive learning. Each course takes about six minutes to go through. You get a little quiz question at the end, and you get certified that way. If I could take your attention back to the uh, main screen, the portal back there, you can see on the left side there's just a port, there's a team roster, so you can see the employees down that left side. And you can see their different status there. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but there's like a little thermometer there. So if it's blue, you're good to go. If you're red, there's a flag that you've got a problem. And in this example, this person that has a problem, you can see on the main dashboard, Wade Wilson here has a health status. He's been in contact with somebody with COVID. And so that would prompt a follow-up call by uh, our HR uh, group to say, hey, what's kind of going on? Talk us through it. Maybe you should stay home. Maybe check with your health care provider. I can also see what Wade, what courses he's taken, and I can also see that he's um, read the mitigation plan. So I thought that's kind of that elevator pitch, Gene, that we talked yeah, about. Yeah, that's um, great. It kind of gives a list on the left side, a little, uh, some check where it checks the boxes on all these things that we're trying to do in terms of opening up our company and how I feel personally about keeping uh, my employees safe and making them feel like they're communicated to and also uh, make them feel that we've done all of this research with all of the bodies of information are out there. We've coalesced that all together, distilled it down. So any business owner doesn't have to do that heavy lifting because I'm telling you that is a lot of information out of there to put these courses together, make sure you're in guidelines. So there's a whole machine that we put together to put that in place and it can just take that burden off of you because we've contained it in this tool. I got so, so cool, Tim. I mean, you, it, it started out with sort of your as a business owner going, okay, when this reopening happens, how am I going to do it? And I think that's, that's something a lot of our people are, are asking is, okay, we don't know when we're opening up, but when we do, what do I have to do? Right. That's a part of it. And you guys are already in the position doing educational stuff to be able to address a lot of those, which is really cool. Yes. Uh, one quick question for you. Yeah. In terms of company sizes, where it's, I mean, you're, right. you're, a, you're a supplier to the auto industry. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of company sizes do you think, at one level, I'm sure you could roll it out to, out to any size. What are the sweet spots of company sizes that you think are going to want to take advantage of this? Yeah, so it's a really good question. Because we are in automotive, automatically our minds go to dealership and dealership operations because that's a lot of what we're involved in from the corporate level. And um, NADA survey in 2016 has the average amount of employees at a dealership is about 70 people in that dealership, 70 to 100. 
So we're in that small business area between, you know, 500 down, 500 okay. down is where we see this uh, could be handled. Some of you know, big company like Ford and a lot of big manufacturing, they have all kinds of resources to handle this in different ways and different ways they can get at it. But if you're, you know, if you're in that hundred person range, like I'm in or 200, this can really help you out. It's really a sweet spot. That's and, and yeah. Let's face it, you know, even in our situation as a dealer, he's just trying, they're trying to get back and get their operations up and running and sell vehicles and service vehicles and take care of their customers, right? They, they don't have the bandwidth to get a little team put together, put some training together, put some compliance together, that kind of idea. And this just kind of hands it up to them and puts a little ecosystem together for them. And then they can tell customers, hey, we're, we're doing training. We're doing all these things to be in compliant with what the latest um, guidelines are from uh, federal and state. Because uh, this gets very micro. We talked about that earlier, right? You can get down to the county level, Wayne County, Oakland County, different changes there. You flex that into your mitigation plan and communicate that out to your employees. That's great, Tim. Tim Connor, Alteris. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Gene. Appreciate being here. Appreciate it. Well, we appreciate that. And I think it's, it's really appropriate as we, as we go to uh, this whole question of how and when and all the details around reopening. Uh, it's really fun to see people putting solutions together. Number one, if you're a business owner, you got to be thinking about this. And uh, I really love it when I see a company that puts together what they have and starts to address the, the need that they can see that's, that's coming up. Well, that's great. Those are our guests for today. I want to tell you a few details about uh, emergency use authorizations, although there's not a lot of action this week from FDA. There are now 72 test kit manufacturers and commercial laboratories with an emergency use authorization. There are 24 high complexity tests. Uh, there are no new personal protective equipment decon systems that we saw this week. I want to give you just a couple of highlights from Appendix B of the ventilator uh, table, which is right here. Hopefully that's showing up. Somebody will let me know if it's not. Uh, not, a lot of new, not a lot of new things here. If we come to the ventilators themselves, we're going to find the... Uh, I think there's one new ventilator that's been cleared since our last uh, meeting. There it is right there from Lanik Medical Systems. It's a mechanical ventilator cleared on May 12th. And then uh, the ventilator tubing connectors, there are a few new ones there. Um, but largely that's slowing down. We see here Valhalla medical supply, single use emergency ventilator two-way manifold. Um, so that action is sort of slowing down right now. Of course, the, the hospitals seem to have enough equipment right now, still waiting on the question of a second surge, uh, but that's your latest there. We'll obviously keep the emergency use authorization stuff up to date for you. As time passes, obviously this will turn into more of a general purpose FDA um, information session and we'll, we'll get to that as we go. What we wanna do next, is talk to folks about um, their questions. What questions do you have in your, in your work, in your response to this? We would love also today to hear from any companies that are, um, have, have response plans, like how are you going to reopen? I think that would be a really interesting thing to talk about next year as we get into Q and A. If you, let me ask that first, if you have a response plan that you're working on and you'd care to share some details or challenges with us as you're getting ready to reopen your business, whatever size it may be, um, feel free to tell us about that. And also if you have any questions that you'd like us to answer about the emergency use authorizations or anything else that you've heard on the show, we would, uh, we would love to hear from you. So feel free to raise your hand if you have any. Um, I did see a question written in from Bob Becker from NT Fabricating. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a long question here. Bob, if you're there, would you, um, would you wanna come on uh, live and ask your question with us? Go ahead and raise your hand if you are there, Bob. I am not seeing Bob popping up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna answer Bob's question here though. Um, he says, I have a facility where I make sound insulation for the auto industry. My existing die cutting equipment made it an easy transition to start manufacturing face shields. I have 120,000 in inventory. That's a lot of face shields. And I'm continuing to produce. 
Uh, everyone that has bought them has told me they're far superior than others in the market. Knowing this, I may want to continue manufacturing these even in the years to come. That's really cool. That's really neat to hear a local manufacturer that uh, thinks they've found a new, um, a new product that they can keep going forward with. So Bob's question is, is there a certification process required for face shields? And the answer there, Bob, is that uh, it really depends on what you're selling them for. If you're selling them as a medical product for medical use, there will be some things that you have to go through. Feel free to contact us to talk about that. Um, if you're selling it for general purpose or you're selling it for maybe uh, construction use or things like that, there may be specific standards that you have to meet. There may be NIOSH standards, but not necessarily FDA standards. So let's clarify which types of products you're going to sell that for. And uh, there may be some certification you have to do. Question you also asked was, do hospitals, medical facilities, dentists typically buy through distributors? <clears throat> and the answer is they often do. And uh, how to recommend a distributor to reach out to, it really depends on the institution. Uh, many hospitals have purchasing organizations, group purchasing organizations, <coughs> excuse me, that they go through. And um, it, it, it is a chore to get into those group purchasing organizations to get to their purchasing fairs that they hold. Uh, and that's a, that's a job in and of itself. Uh, many smaller places do buy through, through catalogs and distribution centers. And um, if you want to talk more about that, I'm sure we could, we could chat, but that's usually how people get to these things. Um, and you also had a question, Bob, about would it be helpful to align with a distributor now to help sell my current stock? Uh, most likely. I mean, if we have any hospital systems or anybody else on here today that would like to uh, reflect on Bob's question for him, what do we do for folks who have these uh, PPE resources out there and they're having a hard time getting them, getting them out? Um, how can we make links for them? That'd be a great, uh, great, great question if anyone has any answers for us. Okay, I think that uh, hopefully that answers uh, Bob's question. Any other questions out there from the group or any um, open forum check-ins? Do you have an update or an effort that you are underway with that you'd like to tell the community about? Feel free, this can be a little mini advertisement. Feel free to take 30 seconds. Tell us about your company, about your efforts, about your needs. I'll just give a couple minutes uh, for that. And otherwise I will do a check-in. And once again, thanks to um, Aaron Kerr and Adrian Harris and Rick Routson and Steve Minus who have um, doggedly just uh, stuck with it these last uh, nine shows as we've tried to bring this to you. Um, and we really appreciate their, their help in this. One last call for questions. And not seeing any, I just want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you to all of our panelists for all that you do. We're going to be back next week talking about uh, this reopening question. We're going to continue to interview folks with forward-looking ideas because this is now a long slog. And we want to hear all those forward-looking ideas. And as time passes, we're going to start to get back to the business of uh, medical device development, startups, and the community that we all share and have seen come together so well. And we're just going to keep those conversations going. So I thank you all for being here today. I hope you have a great day.